Um, welcome, and in some respects, uh, to many of you, welcome back to the Institute. It's very good to see you here again. My name is Peter Riddle. I'm director of the Institute for Government, and particularly welcome to what I, I know is going to be an absolutely fascinating uh, event um, this lunchtime. The formal title is Management and Leadership in the Civil Service, an International Conversation with Ian Rennie. Now, Ian is a, is a very good fr um, a friend of us here at the Institute. Whenever he, he comes over from New Zealand, he always pays us a visit, and we have an absolutely fascinating conversation because as State Services Commissioner and Head of State Services, he has a role uh, which some of us think would be um, um, an interesting model for the UK, and it raises a number of fascinating questions about the relationship between politicians and, and uh, permanent secretaries or chief executives um, of departments. Um, he's going to discuss the, um, uh, his role uh, uh, in leading uh, the civil service in the performance uh, appraisal system they have in New Zealand and um, uh, managing all of departmental secretaries. Um, the interesting fact, I'm very glad that Ian's here. He's also been up to Scotland earlier this week to see um, the um, very interesting model there and to talk to um, Peter Housden and people in the Scottish Government um, because New Zealand's only 80 days away from a general election. It's actually two days after the Scottish referendum it's going to be and um, he's going to be already very busy in the run-up to the election. That's a very interesting um, com comparisons and, and indeed contrasts uh, um, with what happens um, in the UK. A response is going to be given by Mark Lowcock, and I'm very glad to welcome Mark. I mean, to say um, it's very good to see you in the country um, is actually a tribute to your role as Permanent Secretary uh, at the Department for International Development. Um, Mark was telling me he returned last night from a meeting in Switzerland um, of various um, agencies involved in international development. But he's here in a slightly different role today as chair of the Civil Service Reform Accountability Implementation Board. So he's going to discuss um, some of the um, points made by um, Ian and also reflecting on what he's been doing in that role. Um, Ian's going to talk for about 15 minutes about his role as State Services Commissioner, what's happening, the developments there, then Mark's going to respond, I'll raise various points, and then we'll open it up for um, a discussion. So, Ian, welcome. Kia ora tato. Um, thank you, Peter, and it's uh, wonderful to be, be here today. Um, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, our journey uh, in New Zealand, and, and it very much is uh, a journey about how we think about uh, essentially the, the expectations, support and accountability for senior leaders uh, as part of a public sector reform uh, program. And the first point I would make is, uh, while I'll talk about uh, this dimension of public sector reform, uh, because I actually think it is very important, and it's very important, I think, particularly at a time where the public sector is being asked to both maintain some of its traditional strengths, but also to develop new skills and ways of working that it's less skilled in, uh, it is a very important part of reform. Uh, it's not the only part of reform. You have to think about reform as a system, and there are a lot of levers that influence the public sector, whether it's culture, uh, the statements of government, uh, talent, uh, how we uh, recruit and retain, and all those elements of reform are, uh, I think, equally important. Uh, and actually, this dimension of performance, I think, is uh, important about both providing support to those other elements of reform, but also putting pressure uh, to develop some other elements of, of reform. So if I talk a bit about our journey to date, and this is a journey that's occurred since the, uh, the late uh, 1980s, and very much uh, we've spent that time evolving our understanding of three uh, key actors uh, around senior leaders. First is the, the roles of ministers, uh, secondly the roles of uh, chief executives, and thirdly, the role of the State Services Commissioner uh, as the employer uh, of chief executives. And over that time, we've, we've developed uh, a set of understandings about those roles. Some are laid out uh, in statute uh, in the State Sector Act, most recently revised last year. Some are in uh, the Cabinet Manual, which in New Zealand is the sort of uh, fount of all wisdom when it comes to the operation of executive uh, government, uh, and some are much less codified, but uh, 
there are a strong set of, if you like, implicit understandings about uh, roles. Um, and over that time, not just the roles have been clarified, um, but actually a set of relationships uh, have, have evolved to support those roles. And I think it's important to recognise that that model has not uh, uh, dealt or, or uh, wished away a lot of the potential tensions uh, between uh, actors. What it's sought to do uh, is to, if you like, uh, set out a set of uh, default uh, ways of working and default roles uh, that ha happen to anchor the system, but also to give the system uh, some ways of working through issues when things don't go, don't go right. And so if we turn first to the idea about uh, ministers, and, and one thing that's not actually well understood uh, in New Zealand, let alone outside New Zealand, is uh, the 1980s reforms did not fundamentally alter the constitutional role of ministers. Ministers uh, remain politically accountable uh, for the operations uh, of their departments. And the corollary of that in a constitutional sense is that ministers have the, if you like, constitutional licence uh, to direct the operations of departments, except when statute uh, prohibits that. So, for example, uh, in New Zealand for over 100 years, uh, chief executives have been required to act independently with respect to the employment of individual um, public servants. But the Cabinet Manual uh, essentially provides a sort of good governance guide which really has uh, taken that constitutional setting but says very much, well, the role of ministers is to set strategic direction, is to set policy. Uh, the role of the chief executive is to lead and operate uh, the department with a view to support the minister um, but also to support the effective uh, performance of, of the department over, uh, over time. Uh, equally, the role of the commissioner has uh, changed uh, over time. Uh, under statute, uh, the commissioner is responsible for appointing, reappointing and disappointing uh, chief executives. Uh, in respect of all of those roles, uh, that is subject to uh, potential for cabinet veto. Uh, but that cabinet veto has been exercised uh, once in uh, 25 years. And uh, even if it's a, uh, a, a legal option, uh, increasingly the view is it's not a practical option. And so in a sense that the cabinet will uh, support uh, the recommendation of the commissioner, uh, it will be recognised that the commissioner is not only seeking uh, to appoint a chief executive who can service uh, the minister or the government of the day, but also will effectively lead the department. Uh, in return, the commissioner uh, is expected to be uh, highly attuned to uh, the needs of ministers um, and of the, of the wider government uh, and if the relationship between uh, ministers and chief executives uh, doesn't work smoothly to uh, resolve those issues as far as possible or if they cannot be resolved uh, to address the issue somewhat more uh, fundamentally. Um, so in a sense of, you know, that's broadly, you know, the set of key relationships and roles that our system uh, has, has evolved um, over, um, o over time. Um, uh, and I think what's come out of that is a recognition that to make our system work is that the sets of relationships between uh, all three players needs to be strong and heavily trust-based, uh, but with some clarity around uh, ultimately the roles and responsibilities. And so if it, if it was ever fair to say that the New Zealand model uh, uh, was a contractual model, uh, uh, I don't actually believe that was ever a fair uh, view of the New Zealand model, but if it was, I think it was uh, uh, perhaps more fair <coughs> in the sort of uh, late 1980s, early 1990s heyday of uh, New Zealand public management as it was um, uh, briefly and somewhat purely uh, administered uh, in, in, in New Zealand, what I think is much more you know, typical now is uh, the three players seeking to build uh, effectively <coughs> effective and trust-based uh, relationships, um, but have the use of clarity of expectations, whether that's between minister and chief executive, uh, or uh, the expectations between the commissioner uh, 
and the chief executive. We use that as a way to both uh, clarify what at times can be a very ambiguous uh, relationship, but to use clarity to aid the achievement of shared uh, outcomes, um, but also to have the ability uh, to address issues when things don't go well. In that sense, I think it's not uh, dissimilar from uh, the use of contract in the private sector between two parties that have uh, deep uh, relationships uh, between them. The, the contract seeks to uh, support rather than replace uh, the core of, of trust-based uh, relationships. So if I come to you know, where we're heading uh, at, at, at the moment, uh, in summary, uh, I'm trying to uh, use performance management of chief executives uh, uh, much more actively uh, than we have done over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, my own assessment of, of uh, performance management as I inherited it and probably uh, continued it for the uh, first couple of years uh, of my tenure was it was relatively uh, uh, ineffective around driving poor performance. It was a mechanism to help, if imperfectly, help determine remuneration. Uh, and it was a way about putting in place a framework to deal with poor performance. Now, neither of those rationales are... Uh, uh, seems to me uh, wrong, uh, but we, may, we were missing a huge opportunity to use that framework much more positively to drive much stronger performance. Um, and I think the, set of the, the state of expectation setting uh, that we've just changed and, and, and chief executives uh, received a new set of expectations uh, on the 1st of January uh, this year uh, to the 30th of June, which is the end of our financial and performance year, and just before I left uh, to come to the UK, I signed off the new set of expectations for the 14-15 year. Uh, we've moved from having a lot of expectations, uh, because I think uh, you can't really drive performance with uh, you know, too many expectations. You know, it's, it is a blunt tool, uh, and the more things you try to measure and say are important, the less impact that you will have uh, on performance. Uh, we've sought to limit the period of discussion around expectations. Our expectation setting uh, tended to go on for a relatively lengthy uh, period as drafts were exchanged between uh, chief executives, uh, ourselves uh, and, and ministers uh, with, I think, you know, little, little real effect, whereas what we should have been talking about much more was what needs to happen uh, to deliver against expectations and what support uh, uh, can the corporate centre provide to chief executives to be uh, successful. Uh, a, pr a previous approach around uh, chief executive performance was also heavily context specific. So it spoke a lot to the particular issues that an individual chief executive was grappling with in his or her portfolio area. It was very weak around uh, uh, if you like, the collective leadership uh, requirements uh, that a chief executive needed to, uh, to meet. So we've done several things. We've, uh, we've crunched down the number of chief executive, chief, the number of expectations very significantly. So we now have uh, four uh, core expectations. Uh, one relates to ministers, one relates to people, uh, third's financial management, and the fourth is what we call uh, core business, which is really around the quality of uh, execution uh, and, and performance, the performance story within uh, the agency. Uh, we have a, a set of two uh, system stewardship expectations, and we'll come back to stewardship uh, in a moment, uh, which are related to the contribution to support whole of government outcomes and also the development of people, not for the agency, uh, but the development of people uh, as a system, uh, system asset. Um, we focused, therefore, on moving away from describing in great detail uh, the expectations. We have spent more time in working with chief executives about def defining what good performance looks like, accepting that you know, the determination of performance ultimately is more art uh, than science, uh, but we've sought to clarify in each of these domains uh, 
the kinds of behaviours, the kinds of evidence that we expect chief executives to be able to you demonstrate as part of their uh, performance uh, conversation. And actually that's been incredibly well received by uh, chief executives. Uh, and the fourth point is I think we've definitely strengthened the focus on stewardship. And that comes out of a very, uh, we've been running uh, the um, performance improvement framework uh, in New Zealand, which uh, has some uh, antece antecedents in the uh, previous capability reviews, and we have a very good diagnostic about what we're good at and what we're not good at. We're very good around being responsive to ministers. We're very about good about dealing with crises uh, and issues. We're very good about dealing with stakeholders in a transactional sense. We're much less good around developing our people, uh, stewarding the assets uh, in our agencies and preparing for uh, the issues that either uh, an incumbent government or a future government might face. <coughs> so um, the new set of expectations at both an agency and system level is seeking to lean much more strongly around recognising the uh, importance of stewardship uh, considerations. And I think um, you know, there's a number of jurisdictions that uh, have introduced the concept of stewardship in the last several years, and, and there is a danger it's becoming a sort of, a sort of new black for um, public management. And it's easy to, to turn stewardship into a bit of a cartoon that uh, it's all about uh, focusing on the lofty future uh, and serving some future uh, government. I mean, the way I think about it is, is stewardship is akin to a chief executive uh, running an investment portfolio. And the portfolio has payoffs over different periods of time and they all relate to the sustainability and performance of the agency. So some of those investments will pay off uh, in the, the lifetime of the existing minister. Uh, some will pay off uh, in the, the lifetime of the existing government, which tends to be longer than the lifetime of the, the, the current minister. And the third, indeed, uh, looking at time frames that are much more likely to be dealing with successive uh, governments. So for me, there's not a, a, a polar... Uh, difference between stewardship is, is incompatible with either serving the existing minister or an existing government. Uh, I think it is, um, and it has a dimension, though, about being focused on a period of time beyond that. And I think the art of stewardship is about how chief executives uh, manage that portfolio in a way that uh, is what an organisation requires, but also um, is consistent with the sort of political licence uh, that they, they face. Um, so, in one sense, the changes that we're making are, I think, evolutionary rather than uh, revolutionary, um, but I think they, they, are, they are significant in, the, in a number of ways. Um, firstly, they are going to require uh, more discipline on the corporate centre, which in our case is particularly the Commission and our, and our colleagues at the Treasury. Um, in New Zealand, it, it's probably fair to say that central agencies could be accused of, of suffering from attention deficit uh, disorder, um, where we focus on a bright, shiny idea and then we move on to the next, uh, the next um, shiny thing. Um, uh, because of the way we've framed our new expectations around particularly people, financial management and core business, uh, these are going to be very stretching for agencies and are going to require... Uh, the corporate centre uh, to be very active in supporting agencies. So, for example, in the case of the Treasury, uh, the requirements on financial management are really beginning to drive a different conversation about the quality of strategic financial advice available to the public service. And in turn, that's providing an impetus and I think a degree of healthy pressure uh, on my colleagues at the Treasury about... Uh, clarifying and mobilising uh, their professional leadership uh, of the finance uh, profession. So it's an example about you know, why the corporate centre is going to stay you know, quite engaged and I, I don't actually expect there will be a significant difference in these expectations over the next two or three years while we work collectively with agencies. I think secondly it will drive a deeper set of relationships between uh, the Commission and chief executives. It's probably fair to say that at times 
in the past, uh, the, the Commission has been in a somewhat different, distant position from chief executives, where we've been in, if you like, assessing their performance as opposed to managing their performance, which is, I think, quite a different concept. Uh, on my part, I am very clear and I'm very comfortable about providing much stronger expectations on chief executives because our system does need to improve. In return, though, chief executives should be looking to the centre for more support, whether that support is expertise around where good practices or where expertise can be put into the agency, and in particular, um, how the system can support chief executives around the talent that is stewarded at the system level uh, by the Commission. In that sense, I think there are going to be more analogies between the relationship that you see in the private sector between uh, a group office and subsidiaries, where you know, part of the conversation is, uh, in terms of supporting the success of the subsidiary, what are the assets that the group is prepared to invest in the subsidiary. And so I think in a sense that uh, points to a much less transactional relationship between the commission and the chief executive and a much deeper sense about mutual responsibilities to drive a stronger uh, performance. Uh, I think it also uh, points to uh, the need to develop uh, stronger and deeper uh, relationships uh, with, with ministers. Uh, and one, uh, for one point, we're actually asking chief executives not, not solely to focus on uh, the responsiveness to the current minister, we are also asking the chief executive to focus very strongly around a renewed push around organisational leadership with a view of both supporting uh, what the Minister of the Day is trying to do, but also uh, a, a broader view about uh, performance. That requires, particularly I think, the Commission to be reflecting to the Minister uh, their holistic view of the chief executive's performance as well as understanding uh, the Minister's view of the chief executive and uh, the support that they are provided by uh, him uh, or, or her. It will, I think, have implications for our, our broader programme of public sector reform, and I think uh, that is quite uh, deliberate. Uh, for chief executives to deliver on their new expectations, uh, they will need to actively support uh, complementary initiatives that the centre is seeking to manage around the development of talent and professions in the wider public service. And we're really beginning to see, I think, the very early uh, and positive responses uh, to that. But so from my point of view, I renew the focus on uh, senior leadership and its responsiveness and uh, clarity about its expectations will help, I think, to dr drive and support uh, a wider programme. And I think the final point uh, that I'll make here is I think uh, in a wider sense uh, what I'm really trying to uh, build here is a much stronger sense of uh, collective leadership across uh, the public service for public service performance. Uh, many of the diagnostics about what we don't do well have been with us for 15 to 20 years. Uh, and I don't think it's a good reflection on our public service that it's only the last few years that I think we've really meaningfully try to grapple and deal with those issues. I think there has been a tendency in the past uh, to look up to, uh, to ministers and to wait for the next public sector reform uh, program. Uh, those can be a, a long time in coming um, and when they come they won't necessarily be in the way that we would, we would like. Uh, what I think a core part of our stewardship uh, as public servants uh, is around that we take responsibility for the performance of our agencies and, uh, and that our core part of our role as a collective group of leaders is how we improve the system uh, going forward. So quite practically an expression of that will be um, when we have a new government after the 20 September election, for the first time this year in addition to the agency briefings that individual chief executives will provide we will be providing a collective briefing signed up by all chief executives about uh, our reflections on uh, the ways in which the public sector work, our views about uh, mechanisms that we think an incoming government uh, should continue from the point of view of successfully implementing uh, their reform programme 
uh, together with other suggestions about uh, change in the way that the, the system of government works to support uh, whatever agenda a, an incoming administration uh, may want to uh, pursue. Uh, and so fundamentally for me that's the point I want to leave because I think uh, I passionately believe in the value of a professional and partial public service as a core institution in democratic society. Um, but we can't just assert our right uh, to uh, run our agencies as our professional and partial public service. We have to assure uh, whatever group of politicians we face today or into the future uh, that that group of, of, of public servants actually can assure uh, any government uh, that we steward a highly effective uh, public service uh, that actually can deliver on the ambitions uh, of any government of the day and ultimately deliver great results uh, for New Zealanders. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. There's, a, there's an awful lot there to reflect on, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll pursue. Um, Mark. Thank you very much. And yes, Ian, thank you very much. It's, uh, I guess uh, everyone knows mm. that over the last 15 years or so, there's been a lot of study of the New Zealand and Australian system, actually, uh, and because you've been in the vanguard internationally on lots of public sector reform issues. And a lot of what you have just run through strikes a big chord, and I'll touch on some of those um, points. Um, I, uh, e equally, I think it's a really healthy thing that there's a two-way learning going on. Ian and I had a bit of a uh, discussion before the meeting started about some other things happening here which you're interested in, in the, in the digital area, for example. Um, I think that um, one of the things our two countries do have in common is that uh, we are blessed or have created um, a civil service and a public service which um, does well in upholding some core capabilities and values that any country, if they're lucky, wants to have. I spend a lot of, a lot of my time dealing with countries uh, where governance is absolutely the core problem and, and trying to help them improve that. Switzerland isn't one of those, by the way, although I was there <laughs> for different reasons, um, different reasons for the last couple of days. Um, and you know, you don't have to spend long looking at those countries to see the um, enormous value of having a civil, servant, civil service which is uh, honest and impartial and professional uh, and acts with objectivity and integrity and, and professionalism, competence and so on. That is an enormous asset to any nation and uh, you don't uh, keep it just by saying it's an enormous asset. You keep it by continuing to scrutinise and learn from others and um, think and invest and evolve and so on. One of the other things that I think we have in common is um, that uh, we are all the time trying to strike the right balance between being a bit more accountable as civil servants uh, than we used to be in the past and dealing with the fact that a core strength of both our systems is that we work for ministers who are democratically elected and uh, our fundamental role is to help them deliver their programmes. Now, I, I do think, and I, I want to commend to you a terrific lecture Martin Donnelly, my colleague, gave here, I think, earlier yep, in the indeed. week on the role of um, civil servants and how to strike the right balance in relations with ministers and, and trust and all those things. I, I do think it's important to bear in mind that, um, it, you know, Martin's analogy of a play is a really good analogy. Um, a play is rarely improved by having the, the uh, backstage crew the centre of attention. Uh, you know, that's unlikely to make for a better spectacle for the audience or a better experience either for the actors, parallel the, who are setting the, you know, running the show basically, the politicians, or actually the backstage crew. So there are good reasons why lots of things are behind the scenes and should always be behind the scenes. Having said that though, I think um, it is the case that with the um, decline of deference in Western societies over the last generation or so, with the growth of transparency, which personally I think is one of the biggest forces for good in public policy globally, um, and with some other changes in society, we've had to 
just move the dial a little bit on, on where exactly the, um, the sort of accountability relationship should, um, should see it. And I want to touch on some of the things that um, we've been doing here, which sort of build on and have the same rationale for um, some of the things you've been doing. So the first thing um, is about um, the role of permanent secretaries or the chief executive and how people know what their role is. So we um, have, for the last few years, published permanent secretary objectives. Um, we haven't always published them as early as we should have done in the year. I was um, invited to do a review earlier this year on how we could do a bit better on that, and I hope we're about to publish this year's objectives. We've also um, tried to be a bit more, a bit clearer, as people will see, I think, when we publish this year's objectives, about the mix of roles permanent <coughs> secretaries have, and it, it aligns very much to the things you've spoken about. So a core role is obviously delivering the agenda of the government of the day, and there's some specific objectives that all of us have in our performance framework um, that, that ought to be known publicly and that we ought to be held account for. A second role, though, is the, um, is the stewardship role. Um, you know, if you want to sustain a um, civil service which is competent and effective for the longer term, you have to build it for the longer term. And um, being explicit that that's one of the responsibilities, I think, is a healthy thing. And then a third thing, which again is reflected in all our published objectives, is the fact that you, you're part of a, a wider collective system. And being explicit about that as a principle, but also as we are being in this year's published objectives, what each of us are going to do individually to contribute to the collective management of the system, I think is a, you know, is a healthy thing to do. So you publish the objectives, then of course the, the next stage is around the appraisal <coughs> system. Um, now the appraisal system, I, I think for permanent secretaries, is much less well understood here than maybe would be, um, would be healthy for the system. So I just want to say a little bit uh, about it. I don't think there's any news in what I'm going to say, but I'm surprised by how few people know how it, uh, how it works. Um, first thing is that there are, there are you know, heartwarmingly large numbers, of, large numbers of people who are willing to contribute to the annual performance appraisal of permanent <laughs> secretaries. Um, the most important voice uh, that is heard is the voice of the Secretary of State. And the, the most important conversation that takes place is between the line manager, either Bob Kerslake for most of my colleagues or, for, or Jeremy Hayward in my case, in the case of one or two others, between that person and the Secretary of State. Um, and it starts with a conversation, here are the objectives, how well do you think um, Janet or John has performed against them? Another important voice is the voice of the lead non-executive director. Uh, this is um, something that we, the, the system of bringing in uh, slightly more formal supervisory boards and professional people onto them is something we talked a lot about three or four years ago and haven't talked about so much in the last year or so. But one thing that's bedded down really well uh, with, the, with the NEDS has been their role in helping shape performance appraisal. There's then a process um, where uh, the centre, broadly understood of government, um, people from the Treasury and uh, ERG in the Cabinet Office and the HR side of the Cabinet Office get a chance to comment on how well the department and implicitly the Permanent Secretary has done on the shared objectives. And then for me there's something which is really, really important, which is a formal 360 degree um, process where your direct reports and your peers and your external stakeholders um, get a chance to, uh, to you know, say what they think about the last year. And that, um, obviously lots of organisations use 360 and we use it across the civil service, but it is that the tool that's used for permanent secretaries is a much more sophisticated, heavily invested in tool than a lot that are used. Then all of this material is sort of aggregated up, served uh, by Bob and Jeremy in front of the Permanent Secretary's Remuneration Committee, um, who, uh, is, who are chaired by John Brown, um, who then makes uh, you know, their assessments and makes recommendations to the Prime Minister, who takes an overall view, including on the thing I have to say, which tends to be, um, you know, it's part of the system, but tends not to be the most interesting thing to us, which a which, uh, small proportion of us are going to get some small non-discretionary payment uh, as a result of our efforts in the year. But the sophistication <coughs> of that system, uh, what I've described as the internal system, um, then goes alongside some of the external scrutiny 
some of the best bits of which, actually, I think are the things that the IFG has been doing over the last two years. Those reports you've published of how departments are doing, how we've each done against our objectives formally and, and sort of informally, I think that also adds to the wider debate and discourse in a healthy way. Next thing we've done is address this issue of um, tenure. We, we, uh, Francis Maud came to talk to you and to your Australian counterparts uh, about this issue of whether it would be better for us to move to a system of fixed term contracts. And we've decided in our system that wouldn't be the best, um, best thing to do. But what we have decided is there should be great, greater clarity over tenure for permanent secretaries. And the system we now have, which has been in place since last year and has been used for all the appointments since certainly the sort of middle to end of last year, is that we're appointed on a five-year term. Uh, during the course of the fourth year, uh, a discussion will take place between uh, the Cabinet Secretary or the Head of the Civil Service and the Prime Minister on whether it would be helpful to have an extension for that person. And sometimes there'll be good reasons for that, maybe to do with the electoral cycle, maybe to do with unfinished business. Um, and if so, how long the extension should be. The proviso being the extension can't be as long as the original appointment. And I think having a bit more clarity over that, again, is a helpful thing for the, for the system, but which doesn't, without having some of the, what would be drawbacks here in, in a um, more formal fixed term contract um, system. The next bit of accountability that we've had to think about is the role of um, very senior civil servants vis-a-vis -vis parliament. Because parliamentarians um, observe that, as a practical matter, very senior civil servants end up having to take significant important decisions on projects, for example, which, is not, which no one can seriously think it's realistic to expect um, the Secretary of State to have to carry the CAM for. So you need, a, you need a slightly clearer system on who exactly is responsible for what, certainly the project level. And with the greater emphasis we've put on uh, making sure major projects are, are run more effectively than they were in the past, a little bit more clarity uh, and transparency in that area is something we've decided we needed. So what um, we have done is, is uh, <coughs> the government's major projects portfolio, 365 or so projects, there's a senior responsible officer, and um, under proposals the government has made to Parliament, those SROs will be um, liable to be um, invited to Parliament to explain progress with projects, including uh, in some circumstances where things have gone wrong. But they will also, in a departure from the normal arrangements, be allowed to say if they did something because a minister asked them to make a change. Normally there's a sort of veil of um, uh, kind of opaqueness on exactly uh, what, how decisions are made on uh, you know, public policy areas, but we've decided to um, just open up a little bit of that uh, in respect of decisions uh, on the implementation of uh, approved projects, just so that there's a, a little bit more um, capability, really, of the SROs to feel they have um, a bit more space to do what they think they need to do to implement the project um, effectively. The, um, the, the other thing we've done is building on uh, the capability review system that um, we both have had for a number of years which again touches on some of the things Ian said, is um, sort of create a new generation of capability reviews called the Departmental Improvement Plans. The first iteration of which for each department um, has now been published and the second ones for um, two or three departments have been completed but not yet published. Um, to, to try to have greater transparency on how each department is doing across the board on implementing the Civil Service Reform Plan and on wider... Uh, on the, the sort of wider agenda they have for um, stewardship and ensuring the long-term health and effectiveness of, of the department. And one of the biggest features of that, again picking up something Ian talked about, is a much stronger focus on people and succession planning and building talent for the future, including a diverse talent, than we've been explicit and public about um, in the past. The other big important feature, feature of those um, departmental improvement plans, I think, is um, much more explicit attention to um, functional leadership and how across government we're going to 
uh, use central capabilities to improve the effectiveness and professionalism of whether it's the IT area or HR or finance or internal audit or legal services. Um, so, um, lots in common between us, I think. It's, uh, uh, it is a healthy thing to have the mirror held up in front of you and to be told, well, in this country over there, which we admire, they do things a bit differently, and have you thought about that? And uh, certainly, uh, we will continue to follow with interest you, the next stage of your journey. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Can I just pursue two or three points before we open it up? Starting with, with Mark's exposition, very, very, I, mean, I think it's the, the fullest I've ever heard um, of how the appraisal system works. Um, but there's a contrast in a sense. There's still a more public system in New Zealand to, to, to many respects. It's the assurance, say for, for a common select committee, um, that they feel that the um, you know, you, you will appear before two select committees, the International Development Committee and the Public Accounts Committee, um, that, that you are properly being appraised. They have to take it, for, they, they take it on assumption here, don't they? Well, I think one of the reasons why it would be a good idea for it to be more widely known what the process is, is to provide a bit of assurance on that. I, I think um, I, I never feel when I'm in front of Mrs. Hodge and her coloured colleagues that I'm being underappraised by them. Um, and I don't feel that in front of my select committee either. Um, yeah. And actually, that's a, it's a complementary bit of the system. Um, so I think it's fine, personally, that those two things can go mm. alongside each other. But I do think it would be good if more people, as I say, had a deeper understanding of what some of the other processes are. Yeah, there's a distinction between underappraised and informed appraised. Well, one of the other advantages, okay, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying we've got the perfect system, and, and I think you're onto something which is important. I, one of the reasons why it's, it's um, a good idea to have external independent scrutiny of the mm. sort you mm. provide, mm. and why it's a good idea to have as much as possible in the public <coughs> domain in terms of our objectives yeah. and what we're trying yeah. to uh, achieve is to increase the probability that um, I'm not just underappraised by Mrs. Hodge, but I'm 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 not just overappraised or you know however you like to, to view it, but I'm also that's happening in a well-informed way. Yeah, I indeed, agree exactly. with that. Yeah. Now, it, how does was one thing which you d didn't really get into was how does the political process f fit into what you've described? I'm sorry, the parliamentary process, I should clarify. How does it fit in there? Because you have a very explicit, very clear cut, and now well established system of, of expectation, as you described, which is a very interesting phrase. Um, and how does that fit in with uh, the parliament holding the executive to account? Well, I think one of the. Um, that, that's an interesting question because. Um, as I explained, explained to our colleague this morning. One of the features of New Zealand, I think, relative to the UK, is I think the New Zealand Parliament uh, is relatively weak in its scrutiny uh, of the executive in relationship to its role around scrutinising legislation. And there are a number of reasons for that. We have a smaller parliament. Uh, we have a unicameral camera system. Um, we have much higher levels of primary we put more stuff into primary legislation and hence into the parliament uh, than in the UK. So in a sense of, you know, um, you know the, the real focus around the political process is the executive, mm -hmm. is the cabinet. The, the parliamentary process uh, in, in the context that we're talking about is, 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 is very weak. Um, you know, so for example, uh, we have two formal occasions uh, that we go in front of, of the Parliament. Uh, one is in the context of the, the estimates process around the, the budget, which are in New Zealand appropriations are sought by the Minister, so the Minister will go along with the Chief Executive. Um, and it, to be honest, is not an illuminating uh, experience. You know, um, our most recent experience with my Minister, we spent uh, 35 minutes in total which is the context of a huge reform program is, uh, is interesting. And then on, on, there's a financial review, which is uh, the chief executive's report on their stewardship of the agency, which is, a steward, which is the chief executive 
uh, alone, uh, but not all, not all select committees will call all chief executives. It will end up being a, a small sample, or sometimes a small sample, sometimes a large sample, but <coughs> a, nonetheless a, a sample. So in our, our context, parliamentary scrutiny is, is a very weak part of the overall uh, system. The other point I'd like to develop is it's a very interesting point which emerged was, you know, you talked about what you're going to do after the election. Of course, one point is, of course, that the, unlike here, even though it was five days um, in May 2010, it's pretty rapid. You will have a process, uh, um, unless there's a, you know, a majority of governments and all that, of, of some weeks in government formation, I mean, more like Germany uh, mm. and so on, and a lot of other countries, um, um, but which gives you more time to prevent your co collective view. But there's a sort of a collective view which will be publicly available. Yes. So mm -hmm. all, all of the initial briefings from, from agencies and this collective briefing will be the mm -hmm. same. Uh, you know, the practice is New Zealand, they're proactively released by the government mm -hmm. you know, at some point you know, after the election. Because I think the contrast there for you, Mark, where there's acceptance, all policy advice is confidential. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there are boundaries on FOI which are you know, still being tested and settled down. But the, the, the remain ambiguities about a lot of the stuff Ian was talking about, about system, system stewardship, the tendency, expectation of looking long, it's implicit in what you do. But because the overriding thing is you serve the ministers of the day, there's a constraint on doing a lot of the things which Ian describes as him doing, of presenting views on system stewardship, let alone doing it publicly. Um. I don't know. I mean, I think when it comes to policy choices, that obviously is the case. I think, I think there's probably more in common, actually, when it comes to um, ensuring that you're building and sustaining a system that's going to serve the country well for the long term. So um, I don't know. I find it hard to think of an example of a sort of stewardship issue um, that's so contentious that... Uh, you know, you, you, you'd find yourself giving or, or responding to one direction from one government as opposed, and a completely different direction from another government. The differences tend to be uh, policy choices rather than building a system. I mean, give, give, let me give you an example, which is a very interesting one. Um, Ian come down from Scotland where he saw the Scottish government action. It's a, it's a unified government structure. There's a lot of debate going on about changes in, I'm not talking about machinery of government in the narrow sense of um, will you abolish departments or not, but mm -hmm. in terms of structure of government. That is not an open public debate in, the, in London. And these things aren't policy choices. They're quite fundamental if one's looking for another five years of quite tough public spending to structures of government. Mm -hmm. and, and there seems to be a, a, a cultural difference about how far that can be debated and certainly presented collectively here compared with New Zealand. I don't know. I mean, I think that group of parliamentarians who um, have got themselves together to think about this set of issues into the next parliament, cross-party group, I think Mr Jenkin might think he's contributing quite a lot in this area. I think the, the discussions we're having and the openness of discussions we're having on functional leadership uh, and much more sharing across departments, um, I think that, you know, um, there's quite a lot more in that space than maybe there was a few years ago. Yeah. Ian? Um, well, I think certainly we, we see part of our stewardship role in being proactive around, so for example, uh, for whatever government uh, comes in place, well, two, two things. What, one is we will give, um, we will carefully, but nonetheless, we will give advice certainly to the current government about should they um, uh, be returned uh, from an official's point of view, how they might want to think differently about portfolios. Because we, mm -hmm. we have a big issue in New Zealand about way too many portfolios. We've got 63 portfolios. Which, so it's not an issue about ministers. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very much in the political domain. Yeah. But, but we would give advice around are there opportunities to improve system performance by rationalisation of portfolios. Similarly, uh, for whatever government comes in, we will offer them advice around machinery of government uh, because we will say, 
it's a tool you use, but use it very selectively for all the reasons you know about machinery of government. And these might be your yeah. sort of menu you might think about from our from our view of system performance. So we would say we'd see ourselves being uh, proactive in that in that space, um, uh, and we would offer advice around that. Uh, that wouldn't probably be in the uh, initial briefing mm. that gets public. But obviously, you know, with our Official Information Act, there's you know the probability is that advice will come out mm. you know, over over time. Yeah, looking at the other way, I mean, one of the interesting things that, that that Mark described in terms of the appraisal system, the 360 degree aspect of it, and we have great advocates of 360 degree appraisal in the Institute for Government. I mean, some of some we, we operate it internally, um, and we've operated it um, you know, that is known um, with the occasional minister. Um, but it, the degree to which that process works with you, and also, of course, the innovation here, which Mark underlined, which was the um, um, use of non-executive directors, very experienced, very senior people in business, um, which was kind of strength of boards, and, and supervisory boards, as Mark put it, and that degree of input. Well, I, I, I'd, I'd say, yes, there's a, there's a strong sense of, of um, overlap with what Mark described. I mean, we use 360, we, we certainly... Uh, seek ministerial feedback, we see that other stakeholder um, feedback. Um, I think the, in addition to that, I suppose one thing that we're trying to do is, is to get chief executives themselves to reflect on the performance information that they themselves use within their agency, and very much uh, by changing the focus of the expectations, uh, what we're seeking to, because, well, you know, my, uh, my hypothesis is that actually uh, some of the issues that we're trying to advance around people, finance, core business, uh, those things are not being talked about at all or talked about sufficiently at the mm. top table. And there is insufficient management information that's coming to the top table to, to inform mm. those conversations. So for me, there's a, an appraisal system where you know, we collect information the sort of end that I'm seeking to, to drive is to get chief executives to essentially provide me assurances that the information that they use day in, day out in their agencies mm. can provide that validation. Because in one, one sense, I think that's the, quite a bit of the trick around you know, performance improvement is that those agencies will themselves be scrutinising their own performance because external scrutiny is, is important for all the reasons that Mark talked about um, but it has to be supported by a strong internally driven approach around it not least because at the end of the day no matter I mean, our experience around these mechanisms you're always left with an information asymmetry you know, the chief executive always knows much more than you do about what really is going on mm. and to be honest you know, chief executives can manage mm. appraisal Processes and some do it extraordinarily you know, well. Um, so, in a sense, part of the trick is, is to both recognise that reality, but then put it on to chief executives about if you're a successful chief executive, you need to know about these things. And I suspect when we go through the first round, we will be having an interesting conversation. Well, it's interesting you don't know about this. How are you going to, in 12 months' time, have a fuller picture? You're nodding, Mark. No, I completely agree with that. I mean, of course, it's exactly the same for me when I'm appraising my yep. DGs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, ultimately, appraisal is about making a balanced, yep. mature judgment and yep. it, it drawing on sufficient information and trying to pick up the things that, you know, you both agree you want to do something about for the yep. future. Yep. The more forward-looking you make the whole process, the more useful it's going yes. to be. Yeah. Right, let's open it up to questions. Um, lots and lots of uh, issues there. I see several hands going up. Um, gentlemen there. We'll, we'll take a couple together. And could you say who you are and where you come from? Rahul Alawalia, Department for Work and Pensions. So, very recently in the UK, we split the role of Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Civil Service. Um, and this has happened, you know, this distinction also exists to an extent in New Zealand with the Cabinet Secretary and State Services Commissioner. Um, to all three of you, what is your assessment of how this is working in the UK and what are the lessons to be learned from the New Zealand experience? Right, that's good. Uh, a very interesting one there. Um, gentlemen, yeah. 
Hello, Culver Ranger, former advisor to Boris Johnson. Um, very interesting to hear about the role of management, commissioners, chief executives, and various other leadership activities in the civil service. But one thing I'm surprised I didn't hear was about the role of SPADs and how you see their role and the relevance of their role. I'd be interested to hear your opinions on that. Right. Two very interesting issues there. Mark. Uh, um, well, of course, we have um, got Richard sitting um, at the front here. We'll um, remember previous incarnations uh, when we've had effectively someone who's the head of the civil service and someone who's the cabinet secretary. So it's not the first time that we've had that model here. And, you know, the titles may have been different, but actually um, in the way that Gus and Jeremy worked together under when Gus was the, was the cabinet secretary, um, you know, you can overstate the difference between the two, the, the two of them working together and the different, uh, you know, as one model and Bob and um, Jeremy working together now. Um, Gus was doing a lot of the things that Bob does and Jeremy was, uh, you know, doing a lot of the um, fixing cross-government problems um, of the sort that some other previous cabinet secretaries used to spend quite a bit of their time doing and Jeremy does a fantastic job of doing in his current role. So I think you can overstate the... Um, the differences between these models, personally. Um, I, I, I think that the, 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 the comment I would make on your question is that it's pretty clear to me there are definitely two jobs to be done. And um, uh, they're two big jobs. And I don't think a person exists who can do them both together at the same time. So you can... You know, you can um, organise the work in slightly different ways, but you're always going to need somebody who's got plenty of time to think about the overall running of the civil service. And then you need somebody who's, <coughs> who's spending a lot of their time on the um, core cabinet secretary functions. Um, with any of the models, the most important thing is how well the two individuals work together. And... On that, I, you know, I have to say I really admire the way Bob and Jeremy have set out from the outset uh, to work hard at the co collaboration between the two of them. You know, they sit together, there's some core um, totemic, iconic things they always do together. So the Wednesday morning meeting, uh, Perm Sex uh, meeting, which we've had this morning, they, the two of them always do it together. The Civil Service Board, which... Uh, I and a sort of subset of the other permanent secretaries are on. Bob chairs, but, you know, it's a core thing that Jeremy does. So um, I think, uh, you know, given that there are two roles, uh, it is really important that whoever's in them follow the model that Bob and Jeremy have set to do those two things, uh, to, 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 to keep the two things together. Spads? I, I mean, I think spads are a valuable, important part of the system, uh, actually. The... So one thing civil servants tend to be really quite bad at is giving advice on the politics of things to uh, ministers. And, um, you know, politicians are good at politics and they're entitled to have some help from other people who are also good at politics. And it's probably not... I don't think civil servants should pretend that, that you know, that is something we are good at. Mm -hmm. yeah, on, the, on the dual role, I mean, because in a sense, uh, you, the, this... The, the balance you have with the cabinet secretary and so on. How does that work out? Uh, well, it comes back to the sort of the, the the emphasis we place on collective leadership. So, to myself, Andrew Kibble White, who's the head of the Prime Minister's Department, actually the other the other party, which is really important, is the Treasury, <laughs> um, um, because of its you know at least the Treasury is lockstep with me around state sector reform. Um, it ain't going to happen. Um, so in a sense of, you know, f f it, there's a couple of lenses you look at through. So, so for me, the sort of, uh, uh, it's a very close relationship between the, the three of us. Um, we, we work a lot, we meet a lot. Um, we, we definitely try and present ourselves to the, the, the wider leadership as a, uh, as a team. Uh, between myself and, and Gabs, we are seeking to basically fuse our two organisations much more together. So we have a we have a single team working on state sector reform, which pulls together the treasury and commission staff. Mm -hmm. We've fused our work around uh, major projects, um, 
with a view of, of, of trying to really institutionally embed the connectedness. In terms of the, um, the putting together the two roles about the Head of Prime Minister's Department and um, the Commissioner, uh, look, you can do it in different ways. Uh, and actually, we did have a very uh, good conversation with the current government two years ago around this. Uh, actually, the current government decided they wanted to keep the roles distinct and partly the reality, you know, certainly from, from the Prime Minister, was a feeling that uh, any attempt to look like you're moving the head of the civil service closer to the Prime Minister would be seen as a, as a political negative and the government basically said, why would we want to do that? You know, which I think in a sense recognises the strength of the institution about, you know, the, the, there's a view across the political spectrum about the value of a, uh, an impartial professional public service. I think, the, I think the challenge for uh, whoever is the commissioner, uh, if I go to the point about the, what I think is the implicit bargain between ministers and the commissioner, where the, you know, ministers agree to live with whoever uh, I put up, um, uh, the other side of the bargain is that I need to be incredibly well uh, informed about what do ministers think? What are they really trying to do? And, and I think that shapes both, you know, so I spend a lot of my time with ministers uh, talking to them about a whole, uh, whole range of issues. And I think, to be honest, it will shape uh, the kind of person who can be the, you know, the commissioner on an ongoing basis. That person has to be really good at being able to kind of really elicit ministerial preferences in quite a subtle way subtle way. So in a sense I think there's a, you know, I, I'd be quite honestly agnostic, you know, I think there's a good, good reason to put them together. I think there's also good reasons to have the same set of, you know, arrangements that we have at the moment. So for me it's not really, <coughs> I think, a, a big issue. If I come to the issue about um, SPADs or in our context we call ministerial advisors, there is quite a distinction in, in New Zealand, you know. Um, in part, you know, ministers ministers don't work in departments, so there's a there's a physical difference between ministers, their private offices, and departments, which I think helps to shape uh, a slightly different and more formal uh, difference in the respective roles. But certainly in New Zealand to date, uh, your know, ministerial advisors haven't been, I think, as either as numerous uh, or or potentially as, as influential as they have been, certainly in Australia uh, and, and some and obviously in the in the UK. So very much it's a it's a much less important. How, how many advisors can a minister have here? Uh, it, it will it, it will vary it will vary um, according to obviously the the the, the minister, but um, but typically um, a minister will um, have one or possibly two. Uh, ministerial advisors who are what you might call a, you know, see their role as supporting the, the, the minister as a, as a politician. Uh, there'll be other staff in the office who are departmental mm -hmm. secondees, but it's a, it's a relatively small number. Yeah. I'm of, certainly, of you say compared with a massive number in Australia. That's um, right, in Australia. Or Canada, for some yeah, extent. That's yeah. right. I mean, just, just to add one thing on that, which is something which has come out of our work. Which is everyone talks about advisors, but on the whole, these are junior ministers. I mean, the most one of the most distinctive aspects of the British government is the number of junior ministers, mm -hmm. um, which, despite devolution, we now have more ministers, paid and unpaid, than we had um, before devolution started. Mm -hmm. And the, the, in a lot of the debate, like extended ministerial offices, advisors, junior ministers tend to be ignored. Yet we are producing some work in a couple of weeks' time on implementation, which actually will show the importance of junior ministers in taking forward initiatives once they've been agreed at the high level. And that's a kind of missing link, which we're certainly going to be exploring um, um, at the Institute you know, uh, over, the, over the next year or two, because that, that, that's a very different factor. I, mean, I know it's very different with you with the multiplication of portfolios, but the, uh, the, there is an issue here when you've got often SPADs who are far more influential in their Secretary of State than the junior minister is. Right, I, so I think, we'll, just to comment on that, Peter, I think you're on to a, an underappreciated um, point of our system actually. When, when people say you know the French government or the German government don't have the same number of ministers, uh, 
what, they, what they don't take account of is that they've got much larger political teams around the minister's office. Yeah, yeah. So if you think about the whole political team, the, the size of the difference between us and the, uh, say, the French is, is less big. Yeah. Right, M more questions. Um, behind you, uh, Kerry. Hi. Um, you mentioned that it's... Could you say who you are and where you're from? Sorry. Lizzie Harrison, Civil Service HR, just to drop myself in it. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned that the appraisals and objective setting is all very useful, and it is. I just wondered if there was anything, any ways that you used in New Zealand to measure the outcomes and the effectiveness of that, that we might be able to translate into our processes here. Right, and um, Jill. Um, hi, this is going to be a question just to Ian, because I'm assuming Mark won't want to comment. Um, one of the reasons why people think, or ministers may think, that the civil service isn't that accountable is it appears, we all know the reality is a bit different, it appears that nobody ever gets sacked for a failure at the top level. And we've had sort of you know, recent examples where there are clear views from the political side that the department is letting them down very badly. Um, the civil service may think actually they've been confronted with an impossible task and they're doing the best. But it's, in the UK system, it's incredibly blurred and difficult. I don't know if I said the words universal credit to you, Ian, that would mean anything. But this is a very, very talked at implementation of a really significant and very well supported welfare reform. And I just wondered how in the New Zealand context your system would play out a dispute when something is going wrong, where it's not clear whether it was a political decision that was very difficult to do or whether there are actually flaws in translating it into reality. How would it play out in your system in a way that would command more public confidence perhaps than our system does now? To very interesting question there. I think the, the first one for you, Mark, and then Ian. Uh, well, actually, I think the first one was mm. what can we learn from the New you Zealand? Um, so I'd like to know, actually. Yeah. <laughs> all, right. All, all right, Ian, you kick off and then we'll bring Mark in. Well, I think, I think in, a, in, a, in a sense, um, one of the things that we, we're seeking to do is, is you know, we've, we've been running a performance improvement framework which we regularly review agencies and in a sense you know where the expectations I talked about are much more strongly aligned to the lines of inquiry in those reviews. Clearly uh, as agencies go through both follow-up reviews which are done about 12 months, 12 18 months after in their, in their full, full uh, re-reviews, uh, if the system is working you're likely to see that systemically, I think, in the strengthening of organisational performance. It's ultimately how we'll know that the stuff is actually, um, you know, work, uh, working. Um, I think, um, uh, as I say, I think we will be uh, looking for some other changes in behaviour. So, for example, um, we would expect the kinds of expectations that we're setting for secretaries and chief executives will be cascaded much more down the system. So we will, you can actually you know, measure that because ultimately the, the secretary cannot by himself or herself deliver you know, better people focus. You know, you know, it's got to be so in a sense of you know, you'd hope that you'd be able to see that cascaded through you know, quite immediately the expectations on certainly senior managers and, and in some cases more junior uh, managers. Um, some of the metrics that we will be looking at, whether it's uh, around you know, employee engagement or whatever, you, you know, we hope to see some improvements at. So there's a range of, I think, both uh, shorter term you know, process type measurement and, and longer term uh, outcome. But you know, one of the reasons what we're trying to do is really pull together uh, how we manage the budget, how we manage our improvement frameworks, how we manage chief executive performance appraisal. So actually, uh, the things that we're collecting and observing, you know, they're, they're all aligned much more closely. So that's part of my answer uh, on that one. I think the, the, um, the, the second issue, I mean, coming to your point, Jill, look, I think if you get, went to New Zealand and you had a conversation with ministers, you would, you would get different responses. You know, to be quite honest, senior ministers 
uh, are well aware about how issues between chief executives and uh, ministers are resolved, and, and the, if you like, the palette of ways we, we deal with that. So if you sat the Prime Minister down, um, he would tell you he thinks it works pretty well, and he'd run through a number of examples. Uh, if, however, you're a, a, a junior minister in the cabinet, you might feel, uh, as one does, that uh, actually the best way to run government is for the minister to choose the chief executive themselves and then to appoint or disappoint. Um, uh, and so there'll be there'll, there'll be some differences and differences in view. And to be very frank, that's why part of why I think my role is is engaging much more actively with actually quite a broad spectrum of ministers, because to be frank, you know, today's junior ministers are tomorrow's senior ministers, uh, more or less. Um, I think in terms of when something goes uh, goes wrong uh, in, in the way that you talked about, um, I think the, the, the way that we actually have a way of trying to both analyse what is happening and then for the different players to take their respective roles helps to work things out. Uh, not necessarily, I think, in a cut and dried way. So uh, we, we had a, a problematic um, uh, issue around the teacher, teacher payroll system uh, in, in New Zealand, which was it's a large payroll system uh, and basically every, everything you would want to read about an, IC, an IT-enabled project that goes wrong, went wrong. Um, and it ended up being a very, uh, not the only, but part of uh, basically a, a really tense relationship between the minister and the chief executive. Uh, it was also pretty clear that there were issues about the minister's stewardship, and actually it's ministers plural, not just the the minister, and so over over time, you saw a slightly uh, messy um, process, but one that actually happened over quite a short period of time. About in that case, uh, the, the leadership of the department was changed uh, and was and put in place a, a very experienced chief executive who's really good at running that kind of stuff, uh, and actually uh, the ministerial oversight of that project was changed went to a more senior minister. And so in that, in, in that case, you know, part of the, the, the you know, um, and it would have been seen as a, as a messy thing publicly, but at least the series of conversations that were happening between myself, the relevant minister, the prime minister, we were able to put together, here is what is happening, and therefore here is what needs to happen. And in, in that particular case, Something needed to happen at the departmental level, and something needed to happen at the ministerial level. Thank you. Malcolm? I, well, I don't want to go against Jill's instruction not to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we've got a gentleman here, and then Julian in the back. Uh, thank you, Hartley Miller, Chester University. Um, the question of accountability. Um, seems quite critical to this. Um, accountability can be avoided to some extent by blaming the minister. Interesting comment about what's going to happen on projects. But also one of the reasons why things don't happen um, is that they are not being done professionally enough. And in, certainly in the UK civil service, there have been a lot of attempt to introduce professionalization and everything from procurement to IT. Um, but that introduces another force in the equation which can then be brought forward. To some extent, of course, it's resisted. <laughs> um, is there something that is happening in New Zealand which would um, better accommodate a degree of professionalization at the center um, without um, absolving the departments of responsibility? Right. And? Chief of Government. Um, I thought that was a really, really helpful exposition for both both sides, actually, and particularly on Mark, um, uh, I agree with Peter, that the clearest I've heard our system of appraisal actually described. Mm. Um, I was wondering about the sort of responsibility and transparency mix of the two systems. So for Ian, I just a question slightly following on from Jill's. 
who would the public look to to actually be responsible for sorting out that situation? Is it actually the State Service Commissioner is clearly seen as if something is going wrong, it's part of your job and role, almost a constitutional role, sort that out? And then I suppose a slight reflection, in the UK system, it's very unclear whose job it is to sort out things. Um, if you think about permanent secretary objectives, um, I'm very hopeful we're going to get a set of them which will be able to say, look, there's dramatic improvement, and I know a lot of work has gone on thinking about them, but frankly, if you showed those objectives to any civil servant, they would simply not have been prepared to accept their staff coming up with those type of objectives. It would be a serious issue if they'd been set in such a poor way. I mean, in our system, where does the responsibility really lie? Is it ultimately um, the Prime Minister are other ways of creating more transparency in that leadership of the civil servant um, about who's truly accountable or responsible for making things work better? I suppose I'm, I'm reminded of a, one of the questions that was um, to Martin Donnelly. It was a very, very good presentation on Monday night. But one of the questions from a senior civil servant was like, you seem to be talking about a priesthood here where no one can tell from the outside whether it's good or bad. Um, and what could we do to actually open up that priesthood and turn it more, I suppose, to the previous question, into a profession. Two very interesting ones. I'll start you off on that part. Um, well, just on, <coughs> I mean, firstly, on capability and professionalism, um, I just to, uh, I'm an accountant, among other things. I'm a, a big proponent across uh, government, but also in my department, of the fact that we've professionalised lots of core functions, uh, and we have made quite a lot of progress on that, on IT. Um, internal audit, uh, the way we manage our property, on finance, uh, and in particular on HR and some areas we've got a lot further to go. Commercial procurement, we've got a lot more to do, but I think there's a clear shared commitment to um, do better on all that. And one of the reasons why um, I think that this journey we're on on functional leadership is going to have much bigger long-term impacts than people have quite understood is because of the contribution uh, contribution to that. <coughs> I think it's, um, I, I'm not a priest, I'm not in the priesthood. Um, I, I think, as I, you know, I think Martin's analogy of things that there's a play and some things are best handled by the crew behind the scenes. I think that's not a bad analogy for some of this. Equally, it's pretty clear to me who's accountable uh, in my department for <coughs> delivering the government's agenda and I feel very, very accountable for that. Uh, at the end of the day, I have a very synergistic relationship with my Secretary of State. I mean, the, I, certainly I feel if she's got a problem, that means I've got a problem. And um, I feel very responsible for delivering on her agenda. <coughs> and I think you can worry too much about the um, you know, the sort of um, Jesuitical fine um, detail of what the manual is supposed to say. Um, the, the practical issue is how you solve problems when they arise in the real world when you confront them. Ian? I think to, to come to Julian's point about um, <coughs> in, in a public sense if there was, the, you know, there was clearly a sense of, of significant tension between our a minister and their chief executive, yes, everyone would expect that's the commissioner's job to sort out. And actually, though, part of, I mean, uh, it comes to the analogy about a play, I mean, I think it's a, I take it as a failure on my part if it gets to that point, because A, a you know, you, you, you never want to get to the point where there's really, you know, fundamental and irreconcilable difference. And actually, you know, a lot of my job is around working between ministers and chief executives and in the vast majority of, of cases issues that arise are, are dealt with and you know, everyone moves on and I think that that, that is almost the expectation of every commissioner and certainly I think you know, certainly I know the Prime Minister would see that as his expectation of, of me, you know, he certainly doesn't want a commission that leaves things so late that there's a whole series of of messy stouches between, you know, uh, ministers and chief executives. So, yes, yeah, you, there is a public understanding about this commissioner's role, but you don't want that to happen you know, very often. Um, the uh, question about, um, you know, the question asked, I think, 
the earlier question gets to a couple of things. One is I agree with Mark. I mean, and we, we are we also use the term functional leadership, uh, and we you know our view is for professions that have not been located largely in a single agency, but I feel like more ubiquitous. And you know, HR uh, is clearly one. ICT professionals uh, clearly is policy actually is 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 quite mm. ubiquitous. Um, the way we've organised government has basically meant that those professions have not been mobilised, organised, professionalised in a way that you can sort of see, you know, tax inspectors or um, policemen, women, or, or, or whatever. And so I think, you know, in terms of the, the strength of the system, we see those those sort of horizontal connections needing to be stronger. Uh, the trick. And this comes to ultimately an appraisal is always um, the element of judgment is just in the way you say, well, you know, um, it's a bit like the, the, the child who says, you know, the dog ate my homework. Um, you know, it, it's not enough to say, well, I couldn't do my job because my, you know, my, my ministers, you know, got in the way or uh, I could have really done a good job but the head of profession for X you know, they haven't done their job, you know, you, know, you, you can run that argument, you know, but uh, ultimately it doesn't get her around the chief executive's fundamental accountability for uh, uh, their organisation and its performance. So for me, the, the professionalisation across the service cannot be at the cost and at the abdication of chief executive's uh, line accountabilities. Well, thank you very much indeed. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I knew that bringing the two of you together would produce a very interesting mix of comparison of, of view. Um, as, as, as always, it's, it's uh, been a delight to welcome you back to the Institute, Ian, and we look forward to seeing you next year so you can re reflect on the experience after the election and, and also your collective advice. I mean, it's a very interesting innovation, that. And, and, and Mark, we're very appreciative of you for your candour and explaining, because I think there, there's a real need to demystify the objectives. Um, um, we're, we're always been delighted that, that um, Jerry, one of Jeremy Hayward's objectives is specifically to um, 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 have a good relationship with the think tanks, and we're a named one there. So um, um, I trust that will remain in the objectives, because it's a, a very important, focused one. Um, but we, we, we'll, we'll be certainly analysing very closely when the objectives are published. Um, I realise not entirely in uh, civil servants' hands, the timing, um, and be analysing those, um, both on timing and, and substance. And your explanation of that has been very helpful indeed. So I'm, if you could join me in thanking um, Ian and Mark, it's been very good indeed.